These are 25 bad ways to color fill a laser engraving. And this sharp looking hummingbird was made with one of the four best color filling methods, but you might be wondering what this is all based on. Over the past five weeks, I've spent well over 30 hours testing 29 different color filling methods to compare the results from different types of paint like acrylic craft paint, spray paint, and powder paint. I also tested three different methods for heating powder paint, the use of masking and sealing on the wood, and I even tested some methods on both a diode and a CO2 laser because this actually makes a big difference in the results as you'll soon see. And I did all of this because I had already gone deep down the internet rabbit hole trying to research and find if there was a single best method for color filling laser engravings only to discover that if you ask 10 different people how to color fill a laser engraving, you're gonna end up getting a lot of different answers. So I decided to simply take a big batch of the methods that seemed the most popular and the most reasonable and to just test them all side by side myself. So in this video, I'm going to cover three main things. Number one, an overview of all of the tests I did and how we can narrow that group down to the four best methods that I showed you just a moment ago. And number two, I'll give you a walkthrough of an extremely nerdy flowchart that I made that shows you the best paint fill method to use depending on your specific situation. And of course, I'll also explain how to actually do each of the four best paint fill methods so that you can do them yourself. And this will include some tips that I discovered that I haven't actually seen mentioned anywhere else online. Now let's have a look at the methods that I tested. As you can see, I have laid them out into a few groups and I've mark those groups with blue post-it notes. And what we're going to do here is use the process of elimination to get down to the few best methods. But before we jump in, I should mention that this whole thing is simpler than it looks, and it really is just comparing two things. Number one, the blue groups that are marked by the post-its are different wood treatments, specifically sanding, masking, sealing, and combinations of those. And then within each blue group, there are different ways of applying the paint, like brushed on acrylic craft paint, spray paint, powder paint, and three different ways of melting the powder paint. So let's begin by eliminating the blue groups that look entirely bad. Personally, I think it's pretty easy to eliminate the no sand, no mask, no seal group in the top left corner here because it pretty much all looks bad all around. There's scorching and lots of problems. So I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of that. I kind of knew that this would be bad in advance because this is basically our baseline or our control group. And so let's go ahead and get rid of this. I think we can also get rid of this sand only group because if you look closely at these and I'll lift one of these up for you here, um, basically all of them had some streaking problems. And this really taught me that any of the top methods we're going to end up with will include some sort of sealing, masking, or both. So let's go ahead and take the sand only group and we'll get rid of that as well. Next, let's look at this seal only group here. So I think we can get rid of these methods as well. And if you look at them, I think you'll again agree that it's really badly discolored and the entire group looks pretty bad. And especially you see this if you compare with some of the uh, original wood color from these other samples, you can see that this was darkened quite a bit. So I'm gonna take the seal only group and get rid of that as well. And the final blue group that we're going to completely eliminate is the mask and seal group over here. And if you look at these, I think you'll again agree that they're just, they just don't look really good. <laughs> They've got a lot of this orange discoloration and uh, this is you know from the seal paint and our masking. And so all of these have this type of problem. And so I think we can again eliminate this entire group here. And so I'm gonna grab those and move them to the side. We now have three blue groups left. And within each group, you may notice that there are some pretty good looking options and others that still look pretty sloppy. And so now we're going to zoom into each of these remaining blue groups and compare the methods within them. And by the way, if you're liking the experimental approach in this video so far, then I've got good news for you because this is actually the first video I'm making in a new series that I'm very creatively calling the laser test series. And I'll link to the full playlist at the end of this video if you'd like to see more videos like this. All right, now we're zoomed into our mask only group here. And I think you're gonna be able to see the detail and the tests a lot better here in this view. And as we get started, I should briefly explain how each of these test cards are actually laid out. So first of all, the actual paint test is within the method text and any overlap into the bullet points underneath is just coincidental. And speaking of these bullet points, these actually show the steps that were performed for the method. And these are in order. So for example, with uh, method nine that you see here, you would mask, then engrave, then put the powder in, then use the heat gun, and then weed means to weed off the, the masking. And so that is the order and the steps that were involved in method nine. And if you have a look at the five different methods here, I think number 12 and 13 are actually pretty easy to eliminate because of the streaking. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and pull those off to the side. So 12. There we go. Then over here, method 11 looks pretty good, but it required me to melt the powder with the laser, which after having done it several times, I've concluded that it's just unnecessarily complicated to do that. And it doesn't really look any better than some of our other methods. So I will also eliminate this one here. 
Now we're down to methods nine and 10 here. And I think these are the best looking ones we've seen so far. And if you ask me, method 10 looks a little bit better because method nine uh, has just a little bit of scorching like around the nine and then a little bit on the O. And this was actually user error because I got it a little bit too hot with the heat gun in those spots. And uh, you might also notice that these two methods look a little bit higher than the others because I actually have them stacked. And so let me just pull these down and we'll talk about this for a bit. So this is one of the places that I mentioned at the beginning of the video where I actually tested the methods both on a diode and a CO2 laser. And these ones on the bottom, the nine and the 10 on the bottom here, I did on a CO2 laser and the ones on top I did with a diode laser. And you could tell with the ones on a diode laser that there's a bit more scorching around the letters and they just don't look quite as sharp. Um, and I personally would only recommend for this reason that you do methods nine and 10 with a CO2 laser. But before I get ahead of myself, we need to look at the next blue group. Here we are with seal and sand. This is the second of our three remaining blue groups. And let's get rid of the easy stuff here first. So method 19, I think you'll agree, looks really bad. And I found that the oven method for heating powder paint overall basically only works well when you are also masking. Otherwise, the powder that is left on the outside of the engraving gets baked into the wood and it's really hard to remove with sanding. So because this was not a mask method, it didn't work well and we're gonna get rid of method 19. Number 20, we can also eliminate because again, this one was done using the laser as the heating method for the powder paint, which is just inefficient and unnecessarily complicated. So we'll take that one out as well. So this leaves us with method 18 and method 21. And just looking at this for the first time, you'll probably notice that there is some orange discoloration on both of these. Um, but that's really just because I accidentally over sanded them. This is plywood with a pretty thin top veneer layer and I just went too far with the sander. But despite my sanding error on these, I thought both of these actually had pretty good potential and so I did an additional secondary test just to kind of validate my hypothesis, if you will. And so here's the one I did on method 18. So this is a, a piece of, of different wood and it's not plywood, it's, it's uh, solid, solid regular wood here. And I did this text engraving and I did it using uh, method 18. And I think this turned out quite nicely. Most notably, you'll notice that there is no scorching, right? There's no scorching around the text. The lines of the text look really clean. One issue that you might notice is that there's some like strange texture to the paint. It's got sort of some little like divots and holes in it. Uh, but I only did one coat of paint on this and you can actually make this look a lot nicer, I think, by doing a second coat of powder paint before you sand it, which is something we'll talk more about later. So that's method 18 and here we have one for method 21 and I think that you'll agree that this one turned out really nicely with clean lines, no streaking really, and colors that look really nice as well. This again uh, is, is an example of two coats, whereas the 18 was just one coat and so that's part of the reason that I think the colors here look so sharp. Um, but to me, these secondary tests really help to show that we can move method 18 and 21 onto the next round. Finally, here we have the mask and sand group. Now here, the only one that is easy to eliminate, I think, is method 29, because it has quite a bit of streaking around the text. And this taught me that if you wanna use acrylic craft paint, then you must seal before applying the paint. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this one to start us off. Now this brings us down to method 27 and 28. And there's a couple things worth pointing out about these. First of all, I think they look really nice. And if you are a really quick reader, you might notice that the uh, steps in each of these methods are essentially the same as nine and 10 that we saw earlier, but with one added step, and that is to sand each of these. Now, like nine and 10, these are also ones where I did both a test on diode lasers and a test on CO2 lasers. The nice looking bottom ones here are CO2 and the ones up here that look more streaky and scorched are, are diode. So again, when using masking, your results are gonna be a lot better when you use a CO2 laser for this type of a paint fill project. But personally, since these methods are essentially the same as methods nine and 10, and since nine and 10 basically just have one less step, then the approach that I would take would be to basically just do method nine or 10 and then only to sand if you really feel like you need it because why do the extra step if it's not needed? And so I would kind of consider plan A to be method nine and 10 and then plan B to be method 27 and 28 if you are doing this on a CO2 laser. So because I'm treating methods 27 and 28 basically as backup plans, I'm basically just going to remove them all from final contention. I've now brought in our four final contenders here, and I think this is where things get really interesting because I actually think that each of these methods is actually the best color fill method, 
in a specific situation. And that brings me to my very nerdy flow chart. Okay, here we are in my flow chart. And before we dive into this, I need to first mention that when I first started making this, it was just chicken scratch on a piece of paper. And then my wife came in and actually helped me make it look good. And so I can't take full credit for the way that it looks now. But anyway, basically what you're seeing here is there are three diamonds here, here, and here. And these basically represent choices that you make. And then the endpoints are these square looking things. So here, 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 and here, there's four of them. And this basically is the best method for you based on the situation and the choices that you've made along the way. And so what I'm gonna do here is just briefly take you through each of these decision points so that you can kind of see what the best method is based on those choices and the situation. So if we start here at the top left corner, then the first choice to make is whether you wanna do like a one-time project or if you wanna get a little bit fancier and maybe get into some production run type things. And if you're just doing a, a simple one-off project, then I think really the best method for you is gonna be method 21. And that is to engrave and then seal, then to just use some simple acrylic craft paints that you might already have like in your house or in your shop and then to sand. And before we move on to the next choice, I wanna give a quick shout out here to another channel here on YouTube called Elephant Memories by Joby Mac Studios. You might have found her in your color filling research already, but she makes some really nice videos about doing color filling projects. And she's like a real artist and she makes some really cool projects. And I believe that she primarily uses Method 21 or at least something very similar to it. And so just a shout out to you in the off chance you see this video, I like your videos. <laughs> Moving on to the next choice here. So now if you decided that you wanna do production runs or if you just wanna get a little bit fancy, then the next choice you have to make is whether you're going to do the engraving on a CO2 or a diode laser. And if you're using a diode laser, then the next uh, decision basically comes very easy. If you're using a diode laser, then I think the best method is going to be a sealing method, which is method 18. And that is to engrave, then seal the wood, and then do the powder and heat gun method, and then finally to sand. But if you're using a CO2 laser, then it's actually going to be easier to mask instead of seal. And that brings us to another choice here, and that is whether or not the item that you're color filling is going to fit in the oven that you're going to use for this purpose. Now for me, I used a really cheap $20 Walmart toaster oven that I didn't mind like messing up if I got some paint somewhere. And so I don't know if you would actually wanna use your real oven for this, I probably wouldn't personally, but if you wanna use like a little toaster oven or something like that, then the question becomes whether or not the item that you're color filling is going to fit inside of that toaster oven. Uh, if it does not, then basically your only option is to go on to method nine, and that is going to be to mask, engrave, and then do the, the powder paint and heat gun method because the heat gun, of course, can cover more area and do larger objects than a small toaster oven like I've used, and then to remove the mask. But if your item does fit in the oven that you're using for this purpose, then I think actually method 10 is better, and that is to mask, engrave, do the powder uh, paint, and then heat it up with the oven to melt the paint and then to remove the mask. And there's actually three reasons that I personally think method 10 is better than method nine if you're comfortable using an oven and your object is small enough to fit in it. Number one, the oven can give more consistent results than a heat gun because with the heat gun, you have to manually hold it and sort of wave it around and the oven doesn't have that many variables. And so there's less chance of you making a mistake. For number two, if you're doing like production runs of smaller items like little ornaments or maybe some coasters, then the oven actually allows you to be a lot more efficient because you might be able, depending on the sizes you're dealing with, to get four to six of those all in the toaster oven at the same time whereas with a heat gun, you of course kind of have to do one at a time. Third and finally, you might be surprised to know that getting a little toaster oven like the one I've used might actually be cheaper than buying a heat gun if you don't have one already. And so the Walmart toaster oven I bought was 20 bucks and the heat gun that I used was 30 bucks. And so it was actually cheaper to do it in this way. And by the way, if you're on my email newsletter, I'm actually going to be sending this flowchart visual out to everybody on Friday so you can get it there. And if you're not on the email newsletter yet and you would like to join, this visual is going to be on the seven days of free stuff that you get when you join the newsletter. And so you can get it in that way, even if you're watching this video way in the future. So just a little note on that if you are interested in getting like a download file of this flowchart. Okay, now that we've covered the flowchart, that has hopefully given you a pretty good idea of what steps to take for your paint filling project. But now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do each of those steps so that you can hopefully skip some of the mistakes that I personally made along the way. First of all, when you do the engraving, make it deep like you might be able to see in this example. To do this, my settings will differ from yours. So it's usually a pretty good idea to run a test to make sure you're happy with the depth before you start on your actual color fill project. And for the next tip, if you are doing a sealing method like number 21 or 
18, it's really important that you do the sealing after the engraving. So engrave first, then seal, that's the basic process. Also, it may help you to know that I use the specific type of sanding sealer from the Zinzer brand. And this stuff is made from 100% shellac. If you'd like to copy my exact approach, I think this specific product is pretty easy to get at big box stores. I got mine from Menards personally, and I got good results when using two coats of sealer, though in some cases you might be able to get away with one coat. Moving on. And when you're applying any of the paints, including acrylic and powder paints, I think it looks better to do two coats. This is especially true when doing lighter colors because the black engraving underneath is more likely to show through. Just keep in mind that if you do multiple coats, you should do all the coats before sanding or removing the mask. And if you use a heat gun method, make sure you use a good heat gun on its low fan setting. Because I first tried this method using an older heat gun and it didn't get hot enough, but the fan was still on high, so it ended up blowing about half of the powder away and the results really weren't very good at all. So Ultimately, I went ahead and bought a new heat gun and then I got much better results. If you want to get the exact heat gun that I used, I'll put a link in the description below. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention that whenever doing any of the paint melting techniques, I always wear a respirator just to be safe. So whatever method you use, just make sure you're using the appropriate safety precautions. And when you do sanding, I got the best results by starting with something really rough, like a 60 or 80 grit sandpaper, because that helps get that sticky sealer and paint off of there. And once I got the bulk of the sealer sanded off, I then switched to a higher grit sandpaper like a 120 or even 220 grit, and this worked well for me. And if you're new to weeding off masking, then I'll also mention that I found it really helpful to have a pair of metal tweezers to get the little pieces that get stuck inside of the letters off. And if you've tried everything else, but you still seem to be getting sloppy results, then the problem might actually be the wood. Here's a great example of this. This is what method 21 looks like on a piece of really soft wood, and here's what method 21 looks like on a tighter grained wood, in this case, a maple veneer plywood. As you can see, the wood makes a big difference. And if you'd like to see the results of more laser engraving related experiments like the one you saw in this video, then go ahead and check out this playlist right here, which is going to contain my entire laser test series that I'll be publishing over time here on YouTube. So if that's your thing, go ahead and check it out and I will hopefully see you in the next video. Bye now.